God bless you all. My name is David Ewan, and I head up the Bravehearted Ministry at the Resurrection Center with Pastors Jose and Melly Martinez. Welcome to the Bravehearted. Today, and also during the month of June, we are celebrating Father's Day. And I've got a great message for you, a very powerful message for you. Welcome. I also want to announce that at the Resurrection Center, we're open. We are compliant with the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, based on the, uh, the quantity of people we're allowed to have in the church. We're allowed to have a certain amount, and we have a lot of space still available. So if you want to come to the Resurrection Center, join us Sundays at noon and Wednesday night at 7. Wednesdays are our Bible sessions, and Sundays are the regular weekly church service. You can also follow us on social media, such as Instagram and Facebook at TRC413. Join us on our website, ResCent, I said that wrong, it's ResurrectionSpringfield.org. The YouTube channel is ResCent Spring, R-E-S-C-E-N-T-S-P-R-I-N-G. And so now let's begin. Welcome for, uh, from the Resurrection Center. My name is David Ewan, and this month we're talking about Father's Day. But let me first tell you how this conversation that I'm having with you today began. In 2014, Pastor Jose of the Resurrection Center asked me to preach for Father's Day. The church was new at the time. It was two years old, and I presented the word from God uh, Father's Day. And this is a little bit different. What I'm doing here today is we're presenting a message online. Um, the book Fathers uh, is something that I published also in 2014 in preparation for the preaching that was done that day. That book is going to be free um, from the 17th through the 21st of June. So you'll have um, that at no cost to you. Um, and you'll see that on Amazon. I'll be posting that information on Facebook. Some of you may have already seen it already. So I welcome you uh, to that. Uh, but today I have a new message for fathers. So first of all, let me mention, I am not a, a natural father, but I am a husband. And a year after I got married, um, I was supporting a family of four. You see, we do elder care and we were supporting my wife's uh, mother and father, father is passed, or mother's still with us. Also other family members who came from overseas were staying in our household. So uh, I was supporting a family of seven. Um, so I know what it's like to have not only the, the household that you manage, but also some extra family members who might come in. So I've, I've supported that experience. Um, also, um, I'm a child of nine. I'm one of nine. I, I have uh, eight brothers and sisters. So I saw what my father did. And of course, when you have eight brothers and sisters, you're also an uncle of many. And of course, there's my wife and her side of the family. So uh, I'm an uncle of many there as well. Um, so uh, I'm in a position where I feel I have something to share. And I hope that you find this uh, useful. Um, so um, let me give you a little bit of a background of how the Father's Day holiday existed, uh, or I should say observance. First of all, I was born before Father's Day existed. So I'm from a time before Father's Day was around. Um, in 1966, President Lyndon B. Johnson issued the first presidential proclamation honoring fathers designating the third Sunday in June as Father's Day. Six years later, the day was made a permanent national holiday when President Richard Nixon signed it into law on April 24th, 1972 as the third Sunday in June. So that was really the beginning. So it's, Father's Day is part of modern history. Now let's turn it into our attention to what the Bible teaches us about Father's Day. Um, Let's talk about the Ten Commandments for a moment. The first four of the Ten Commandments deal with our relationship with God. The remaining six instruct us about our relationship with our fellow human beings. The first of these human relationship commands reads, Honor your father and your mother, that your days 
may be long in the land which the Lord your God gives you. And that's in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. You see, it is a command with promise. Give honor to your parents and you will be a person whose life will be of quality existence. Although the person who lives respectful of parents has a much better chance for a long life, the primary theme is quality of living. That's what we're talking about. So it is fitting that we celebrate Mother's Day and Father's Day based on this scripture. Okay, so the reason why God includes this in his commands is that it runs against our human nature. We have to be reminded to honor our mother and father. Can you imagine that? Our tendency is to fight authority. That's because of our lack of maturity. Whether it be the authority of God even, or the authority of our parents. So you see, it is our natural instinct based on our ignorance that we want to be free and we want to do our own things. But we need to follow authority, but we don't. So we need to be reminded, okay? So someone this week gave me um, a, a something from the web. It's, it's titled Father. Uh, it, it's something you can find online. It's about how a child growing up views their father at different stages of life. I, I won't read all of it, but I'll just give an exa example. Um, at four years old, a child might say, my daddy can do anything. At 12 years old, the child might say, oh, well, naturally father doesn't know everything. And at 21 years old, uh, a child might say, oh, that man is out of date. What did you expect? At 30 years old, the child then changes and says, must find out what dad thinks about it. And at 35 years old, a little patience, let's get dad's meaning first. And at 50 years old, what would dad have thought about it? At 60 years old, my dad knew literally everything, which is very similar to what a four-year-old says, my daddy can do anything. I remember as a child growing up, all of my siblings, and there were many, all thought that about my father. So you see, in society, we're searching for the perfect father. Maybe you're a father yourself. If not a father, maybe you are an uncle or a mentor or some sort of father figure. So we're talking about father figures here as well. Okay. So I know we don't like to say much about it, but the truth is, Many of us feel like we have been forgotten when we're a father figure, okay? We know that if mom was gone for more than two minutes, the whole house would fall apart. But some of us get the feeling that if dads could be gone for a week, no one would notice unless something got broken and that they needed a dad to fix it. So that's how I'm used. I'm used as the person who fixes problems. I solve problems. Uh, I'm not looked as, as the person who nurtures, nurtures or, or calms people down. So, oh, that's okay. If something's broke, fix it. That, that's what I do. So I fix problems. Okay. So today we want to discover how to be a father or a father figure that is remembered for more than just being able to fix things when something is broken. So we're going to be looking at Philippians 2, where Paul tells us about Timothy and Aphrodite, two examples of men who follow God's instructions for being a godly man that will help us in our quest to be good fathers. So let us discover five characteristics of God's modern man. So first I will read Philippians chapter two, verse 20 through 30. Philippians chapter two, verse 20 through 30, and then we'll break it down. So the scripture reads, Again, it's Philippians chapter 2, verse 20 through 30. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone looks out for their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon, but I think it necessary to send back to you Aphrodite, 
my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God has had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Now let's turn and discover the five characteristics of God's modern man. Right? We're going to discover five characteristics of mo God's modern man. I call it the five C's, the five C's. Compassion, consistency, cooperation, commitment, courage. So what are compassion, consistency, cooperation, commitment, and courage? Well, number one, compassion. It's men who put relationships before results. Number two, consistency. Men who put character before conformity. Number three, cooperation. Men who put cooperation before competition. Number four, commitment. Men who put Christ before comfort. And number five, courage. Men who put service before security. Let's take a look. For number one, we talked about compassion. Men who put relationships before results. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 20 through 21, we read, I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Number two, consistency. This is men who, who put character before conformity. And in Philippians chapter 2, verse 22, but you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Number three, cooperation. Men who put cooperation before competition. And in Philippians chapter two, verse 25, it reads, but I think it is necessary to send back to you Aphrodites, my brother, co-worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. Number four, number four, commitment. Men who put Christ before comfort. And in Philippians chapter two, verse 26 through 27, for he longs for all of you in his distress because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had it mercy on him and not only on him but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow and number five courage men who put service before security and that's philippians chapter 2 verse 29 through 30. so then welcome him in the lord with great joy and honor and people like him because he almost died for the work of christ he risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. And those are the five. To summarize the five characteristics of God's modern model man, I should say. Number one, compassion. Men who put relationships before results. Number two, consistency. Men who put character before conformity. And number three, cooperation. Men who put cooperation before competition. And number four, commitment. Men who put Christ before comfort. And number five, courage. Men who put service before security. Now let's continue. Let's learn more. So we celebrate Father's Day this month. The greatest need in our society today is for fathers or father figures who will rise up and assume their God-given role of responsibility in the family and in the community. The message that I'm sharing with you today gives basic responsibilities for manhood. Say with me, manhood. 
But when a man becomes a father, those responsibilities are expanded. So let's look, let's look. There's five of these. I told you about the five C's. Now we're gonna talk about uh, the five characteristics of manhood. Uh, a, god, a godly father loves God. A godly father loves his wife. A godly father loves his children. A godly father is a man of integrity. A godly father is a role model of God. So loves God, loves his wife, loves his children, is a man of integrity, and is a role model of God. Let's look at the first one. So if you were to read uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, it's the basis upon which happiness is built and priorities of a relationship. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And the scripture reads, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Okay? So if you do not have a relationship with God, it is futile to think you can relate properly to others. So if you are running from God, you will never have peace and settle that matter, first of all. And you'll know that more of that in Isaiah chapter 57, verse 21, where it says, there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Okay, let's go to number two. A godly father loves his wife. Most husbands assume love is sex. That's not all. While that certainly is part of love, it is not all. And we know this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 33. And I'll read the scripture. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through word, the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. And I just read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 33. See, real love seeks to meet all the needs of another person. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through 13, it shows the definition of real love. So I will read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. And it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always projects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease... The, where there are tongues, there will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, 
hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And I just read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through 13. You see, romantic actions are not an abandonment of your manliness. Open the car door, pull out her chair at dinner, hold her hand and help make the beds and rinse out the tub when you're finished. The list is endless. Okay, let me read Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. You see, a wife for a man is intended. It is ordained. In 1st of Peter chapter 3, verse 7, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. And in Proverbs 31, verse 10, an excellent wife who can find she is far more precious than jewels. And in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, husbands love your wives as your Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. You see, your sons are learning from you about how to treat their wives. One day they'll treat their wives in the same way you treat their mother. See, behavior learns from home. In John chapter 5, verse 19 through 20, again, John chapter 5, verse 19 through 20, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. Let's go to number three. A godly father loves his children. See, love is more than provision for material things. Don't miss your children's childhood. There is no second chance at childhood. When discipline is required, do it in love. And we learn about that in Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. Don't beat them up out of anger or out of ignorance. And children interpret the time spent with them as love. Forget quality time versus quantity of time. Okay, let's go to number four. Godly, a godly father is a man of integrity. Say with me, integrity. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 3. Proverbs 11, verse 3. Three, the integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. The duplicity refers to speaking with a forked tongue like a slithering snake. The phrase speaks with a forked tongue means to deliberately say one thing and mean another or to be hypocritical or act in a crazy manner, an untrusty manner. Let's take a look at number five. A godly father is a role model of God. Hey, that makes sense. A godly father is a role model of God. The image of the father nowadays is not always a good one. Over half the children in America grow up without a father in their home, often abandoned by their father or the father is misaligned in their life. Sexual abuse by the father is on the rise. Then we tell the children that God is their heavenly father. So there's uh, a loss of trust in what God wants to provide us. So small wonder that they were all afraid of God. God help us, dad, you are shaping your child's concept of his or her heavenly father. Dads watch out and father figures watch out. They, children, your children, see God as they see you. Remember we gave the example at four years old, dad can do anything, okay? So be that good role model. In conclusion, the word of God is challenging you to be godly father today. We're a father figure, okay? Will you be a godly father to your children? Today we talked about a godly father loves God, a godly father loves his wife, a godly father loves his children,
A godly father is a man of integrity. A godly father is a role model of God. So we talked about loves God, loves his wife, loves his children, is a man of integrity, is a role model of God. So this Father's Day, rejoice in what God has given you for a family and loved ones. They are of great value to you. Thank you for joining me. My name is David Ewan, and this is The Bravehearted from the Resurrection Center.